am going to talk about uh, validation schemes as a part of our second uh, accuracy masterclass uh, session. So we'll start with some basic key concepts and some basic notation uh, I will use across the slides. And then we'll dive deeper into validation schemes, what types of the validations are typically there in the literature and what are typically what are the schemes that are typically used in practice based on, on my experience. And then we'll slowly move into more practical things uh, like uh, informal things uh, that, the, that are quite popular uh, out there. Like what is data leaks? Why it's important? So what do we uh, what do we call a data leak? Um, I will give you a couple of practical examples, some from the literature, um, but mostly I will focus on some examples from the Kaggle competition, so more practical ones. And in the end, um, I'll try to cover some more uh, comprehensive topics uh, related to ensembling and uh, kind of more uh, comprehensive validation schemes. Let's start with some key, con key concepts, some basics. I will introduce some uh, uh, simple notation and some terms I'm going to be using uh, across the presentation just for every, uh, for every one of us uh, to be on the same page. Today I'll be talking about models, metrics, data sets, and evaluating the models. Uh, let's start with the models. Um, the validation topics are rele relevant for pretty much all the models out there. I will focus on uh, I will focus on supervised machine learning models that include typical tabular models, uh, linear regression, ge uh, generalized linear models, trees, GBMs, random forests, and many others. Uh, neural networks also um, actually have a dependent on properly validating them and properly setting up the validation schemes. Uh, we'll touch a little bit time series models, uh, so forecasting models and few pe peculiar uh, issues that might arise when you're training one. And actually it can be applied to um, more models out there. Uh, but I would like to stress that even such like basic concepts, which are usually uh, covered by every single machine learning book. They're, um, they're very important. They were important before. Uh, they're still extremely important, even if you're doing a lot of deep learning. Um, uh, even then, like the, the basic principles still hold and the topic is still very much important to follow, to be aware of, and to master. Second notion is a data set. Um, it's kind of a crucial one. Usually in the literature, we describe a data set as a set of pairs X and Y, where X is the predictor and Y is the target variable. And our model is just a function which tries to uh, predict uh, uh, or reconstruct the target Y given the X as close as possible. Uh, in order to assess how well our model is doing that, we uh, usually introduce metrics. And we had a previous session uh, focused on different types of the metrics depending on the type of the model. Um, here, I will just I will not focus on it that much. Uh, I'll just uh, say that metric is always something you focus on when you're training the model. And uh, metric is the, the function basically that you will use to assess and pick the best model or judge which one, uh, which one is better, which one is more performant out of the models you have to choose from. And usually it's just, um, it is described as a function of uh, two values, y and uh, the prediction of the model, which describes how well um, the prediction matches the, the reality. So how close the prediction is to the true target uh, value. But of course, looking at like a single value doesn't make much sense. It can be very, very unstable. Um, so whenever we talk about evaluating the model, it's uh, actually putting together three, uh, three terms, model, the metric, and the data set. Uh, model evaluation never uh, is never abstract. It is always connected to a data set. And a model that performs very well in one data set might perform really poorly on another one. Um, so whenever I'm, I'm going to be talking about model evaluation, I'll be stressing that uh, the model is evaluated against the metric on a specific data set. 
And usually, um, I think almost all the metrics are just averages of uh, the metric values over all the records in the in the data set. Moving on, um, uh, model hyperparameters. Uh, it's a very commonly used term out there. Um, I believe there is no strict definition of what is a hyperparameter, but I will be using um, using this term uh, in the sense that it's um, a model hyperparameters uh, is a set of parameters that define a family of models. So uh, whenever we talk about a specific type of the model, we will uh, also introduce a set of the parameters which would define how the model is going to look like. Some of them will drive the model complexity. Some of them will not. Uh, will not. And um, the choice of the hyperparameters is quite judgmental to the, um, because some of the things might be fixed given the task or given the type of the model or by choice of the data scientist. Uh, depending on the type of the model, hyperparameters might be uh, very different. For a linear uh, model, usually if it's a generalized linear model, you can pick a link uh, function, you can decide to fit or not to fit intercept, uh, you can choose optimization method if it's, uh, say, logistic regression, and decide the number of steps of the optimization routine or uh, more commonly uh, pick the regularization parameters. So you can uh, choose to go for L1 and L2 regularization or both. And then uh, depending on the values of the parameters of regularization, you will be getting uh, different models using the same training data set. For trees, there are uh, way more obvious parameters. So like depth, size of the leaf, uh, um, how you choose the features, whether uh, overall the sample or uh, random subsample of all the features every time you create a split, and the criterion to split, and so forth. Um, there are so many of them. Um, but when we move to GBMs or random forests, we actually add even more because we're building a forest. So on top of all the tree parameters, we can uh, introduce way more uh, hyperparameters here. Um, and with neural networks, it, it gets even more overwhelming. It's, it is very large dependent on the network structure. So if it's a full, uh, fully connected layers, then it can be just network depth and width. But if it's a re recurrent ne neural network or uh, some convolutional neural network with custom structure, you can parameterize it and uh, use uh, some parameters describing the structure of the neural network as hyperparameters. And a few more typical ones like learning rate, learning schedule, optimization method, and number of epochs. But a very important point to keep in mind here is that uh, just the model itself is not it. Uh, usually what uh, supposed, is supposed to be treated as a part of the model is the whole pipeline of preparing features. So things like feature selection, feature transformations uh, and feature engineering, uh, they could and uh, typically should be part of the model and treated uh, sometimes as hyperparameters. So we can introduce an automated feature selection routine, which uh, inputs a couple of parameters and use them as the extended set of the model hyperparameters. And it's a, it's a very a valid approach to follow. Um, now, a little bit more about validation. Um, so that's a very classical picture to, to keep in mind. So whenever we start working on a problem, we get a data set. We usually take a pair of scissors and start cutting it into pieces. Typically, we um, uh, there are like three notion of three sub data sets, training, validation, or and test or holdout. And uh, usually they're used for three different purposes. So the training part of the original full data set is used to run the optimization routine to build a model given the hyperparameters set. So if we're training um, logistic regression, we're using it to run the optimization routine to find the optimal um, parameters of the linear model. If we are training a decision tree, then we're growing a tree and we're using the training data set given the hyperparameters, which defines, say, 
uh, size of the tree, depth of the tree, we built the uh, we built the structure of the tree, and that gives us the model. If we talk about neural networks, here we uh, given the hyperparameter values, we define the structure, and then use training to um, to optimize the model weights to the training sample. So training data will give us, uh, given the hyperparameter values, will give us a model, a single model. How do we use validation data set is uh, to find the best model. So given a set of the models we produce out of the family, we usually choose uh, the best one, uh, which is the model which has the lowest error out there. And last but not least, um, test data set or test sub data set as we usually define it on our own is um, another data set we use to evaluate the, uh, the chosen model. So given the final choice of the model, we use it to apply to the data set in order to know how accurate this model is. And um, uh, there is this uh, uh, commonly different name for the test data set holdout to emphasize the fact that we Put it. Uh, we put it to the side and never touch it until uh, the very final model is ready, and we use it only to assess how uh, how accurate the model is. That poses a question: Why so much uh, work? Why not use the entire data set? Why do we need to have three? Um, a typical picture is um, this one. Um, I'm basically copying a picture from the elements of statistical learning. Um, what would happen if we would not do a holdout sample, if we would not use a test sample and just rely on training sample and fit a model uh, and measure the, the accuracy of the model and pick the best model just using the training sample? Um, the issue might arise and typically does arise uh, when we um, increase the model complexity. So in the extreme case of the modern models, uh, such as GBMs or neural networks that have a lot of parameters and lots of degrees of freedom, especially, especially neural networks, which nowadays can have billions of parameters to tune, uh, they, can, uh, they have very high complexity that uh, gives them the ability pretty much to overfit uh, and to some extent memorize the training sample, meaning that the longer we train it, uh, the better the error will be on training data uh, always. Uh, but if we have a test data set out there, then we will capture uh, the point where um, the so-called overfitting happens. That's the point where uh, the model uh, actually stops um, performing better on the outside data and just starts uh, tuning itself to the training data more than generalized on the general population of, of, future, uh, of future records. And in order to capture this overfitting, in order to find the best model out there instead of training endlessly, uh, this notion of test sample was introduced and um, test sample is uh, with a test sample we can find the optimal here we see it somewhere in the middle of the picture so the, that's the uh, the optimal model complexity would be uh, the one that gives us the lowest test error um, and at the same time we can see that the training error will be still usually lower and uh, for very complex models it can be much lower than the uh, the test error which is uh, supposed to represent the real model accuracy out there uh, the next question is what is the validation sample here uh, where does it lie um, like from the practical experience, I would say, uh, depending on the setup, uh, depending on how well it is defined, it can be somewhere in between training and test. The better it is set up, uh, the closer it is to test. But given certain uh, circumstances, it can um, actually drift a little bit in one direction or the other. A simple example if, uh, is um, if you have a very, very large number of models you fit and you uh, compare on the validation sample, then the validation sample is implicitly used as an optimization routine itself, and then the value of it kind of diminishes over time, and the further away it gets from the test sample. Um, 
but we'll I'll I'll, I'll give um, a couple of examples closer to the end to show how um, how the validation scheme can actually ruin things and uh, validation can lead you towards more overfitting model than um, than getting the model that performs the best on the test data. Okay. So moving on to the cross validation, this is pretty much the the standard out there. So this is the most commonly used way to set up uh, set up a mal uh, validation for your model, with of course uh, certain exceptions depending on the size of the data, size of the model, and other factors that might drive your decision. So the very first thing to do is to define a holdout sample. So something you would put aside and use it only to ensure that the final model you've built is robust enough and to assess its um, its accuracy on the data set it has never uh, it has never seen before and that has never been used neither for model training nor for model selection. Uh, the remaining part, um, uh, we can refer to kind of the full training sample, even uh, even though it's not a full sample. But we uh, we assume that the holdout is not uh, accessible for us until the very end of, uh, of our journey as a as a data scientist uh, building a model. So what we do with a full training data set is we split it into parts of the equal size. In this example, we define k, um, the parameter of the k-fold cross-validation, equal to 3. That would mean that, generally speaking, we cut the full training data set into three equally sized pieces, and we run the model training routine three times, every time uh, leaving out one-third of the full training uh, as a validation and training the model only on the remaining two thirds. And we repeat it three times to cover all three um, non-overlapping pieces of the full training. And this way we build three models. Basically we run uh, the full training routine three times. And generally speaking, we usually, uh, we usually do it with the same set of hyperparameters. So we define set of, hyper, uh, set of values of the hyperparameters and just repeat uh, model training routine three times, just using different different training uh, subset and a different validation subset. Um, K is equal to three in this example, but typically uh, you would see in the literature and on practice K equal to five or 10. Um, but it, it, um, it raises a couple of questions, including uh, the question how to choose K. So there are pros and cons. Um, let's start with the cons. Uh, first, um, we notice that we use only a fraction uh, of the full training data set. So every time we train a model, we drop, uh, drop one third. If K is five, we drop 20% of the data set. And that creates uh, kind of a difference between the data set we will use for final model training on the whole data versus the, the model we're going to be validating, which will be trained only on part of part of it. Another, another thing to keep in mind is that it takes a lot of uh, training time. So especially if the model is computationally, uh, model training is computationally intensive, that can be an issue. So if K equal is equal to five, and we want to do five-fold cross-validation on a large neural network, we will require five times more uh, computational resources required. So if it took, a, took you a day to fit a model, then it will take you five days to finish five-fold cross-validation. And sometimes it drives the decision towards like having a more simple cross-validation scheme, um, uh, typically being um, similar to having a holdout sample. Uh, where you run this cross validation only for one of the five folds and rely on that evaluation only just to save computational time at at the price of not having the full cross validation and uh, not having the benefits of, of it. How to choose K? Um, I have never seen any uh, any strict re uh, 
rules, any strict uh, proposals. So typically it's uh, either five or 10, uh, just for, for the sake of not dropping too much data. So the larger K would mean that the difference between the subset and the full set is uh, growing smaller, but the large K would, uh, would require more computational resources to, to, to fit the model. So usually K5 is, is a good balance, but if you uh, if the model is fast, then you can go all the way to k equal to ten to fix to kind of compensate for the first um, potential issue of uh, running k fold validation. But um, these are the price um, to pay to gain actually quite a lot with a with a properly run k fold cross validation. Um, the first thing is that we're using the full training data set for validation. That would give us, first of all, more robust model evaluation. So instead of evaluating it on just a, a fraction of a data set, we're actually evaluating it on the full training data set. And that's as much data as we have available. Um, besides that, having the full training used for validation um, will enable us to, add, to use model stacking. So, um, I will cover it uh, closer to the end of the presentation, but uh, generally speaking, that's the ability to build um, uh, a next model where the predictions of the first model are the inputs. So that would give you the ability to build some pipelines of models in the future, and sometimes it is worth doing so if the accuracy of the results uh, is more important than, uh, say, having uh, simple model, an interpretable model, or a fast model. And last but not least, um, it is often the case that uh, the holdout sample uh, you define in the beginning uh, is quite small. It's also usually a fraction of the whole data set you have at your disposal. So having an alternative large data set to evaluate the model when the k-fold cross-validation uh, is done properly, it's a good alternative uh, to looking at simply test data set uh, based accuracy. Now um, I'll talk a little bit more about what um, practitioners um, call data leaks. That's a very informal term, but a very generic one. Um, usually used to describe some data-driven issues or cases or situations that cause the model evaluation to be biased. Um, and that can sound as not such a big deal, but it can cause lots of problems. First, um, if you have a data leak, you will uh, very likely overestimate the accuracy of your model. It might be... Um, not that severe, uh, but it might be also quite a, uh, quite a significant one depending on the size of the leak. And if the model accuracy drives your business decision, that can become a problem. So for instance, if you're building a classification model and you expect that uh, you need certain accuracy of the model to make sense out of applying the model uh, to business, then simply overestimating it may break your use case and uh, basically drive the whole exercise you're doing uh, non-profitable and um, you will most likely just drop the model. But just having um, the accuracy uh, overestimated might not be the main issue. Sometimes due to data leak, the model not only reports very high accuracy, but also focuses on something which it's not supposed to focus uh, and overfits and dramatically um, uh, dramatically overfits to something. And when you apply it to the day-to-day -day business, uh, you get a very, very poor performance. And last but not least, stacking failure. Uh, it's very crucial for stacking. So the building pipelines of the models where the output of one model serves as the input for the other. It's very important to do um, to do everything correctly and not to introduce any biases because otherwise uh, garbage in, garbage out uh, rule will apply for the second model. So if you're, uh, if you're supplying leaky or biased predictions of the model one, then the model two will, uh, uh, will of course, will treat them 
wrongly and the the stack you built will not make um make a difference and will probably be worse than the regional models so data leaks is a very informal term uh, usually uh, you can hear it of, of describing multiple very different use cases here um, i'm going to give you a couple of um, examples but it's by no means uh, an exhaustive list of what might go wrong and what uh, can cause data leaks first uh, simple ones training records are used in validation um, that happens unfortunately more frequently than uh, we would like to to see sometimes uh, unintentionally sometimes uh, um, sometimes due to the data pre-processing -pro routines uh, you might find uh, training records in test or in validation and that will drive your accuracy uh, estimation quite high it will not hurt model performance usually but um, it might cause quite a lot of issues second which might sound even uh, sillier uh, target variable is used as a feature but that happens also quite frequently and you should be very cautious sometimes you have target variable either explicitly but um, more often of course um, implicitly in your training data so some target variable derived uh, some derived variable from target or something very closely correlated to the target variable that you not intend to use as a feature might get in there and that will cause again the same issues third future data used when um, also accidentally you might uh, get some of the data fields which are not available at the time when you plan to apply the model so when you apply the model actually these features will be either not available or even riskier they're not going to be populated the way you expect them to be so uh, in the in the latter case that would mean you will uh, it will come unnoticed because the model will not fail it will receive these features they will be just not populated the way you would expect them to for instance if you're um, if you're building some credit scoring models and you um, and you have feature describing describing uh, the behavior of your customer you would like to have this uh, behavior uh, to be coming from the data you know up to the moment um, of the model application and not from the future but if you have a leak so one way or another you get this information into your training data sample you might not notice it and when you move the model to production it's it's just going to be a dramatic drop in the performance that you will need to investigate um all the uh, the two the the uh, the last examples uh, can be aggregated uh, under the category the input feature is not available at the inference time but it's kind of a broader category to pay attention to some other examples which are a little bit trickier because they're not exactly out there and sometimes uh, data scientists might not be aware if the the content of the data is not known well uh, there are records that are correlated between training and validation for instance a credit scoring example uh, if you have data records from the same uh, customer just uh, collected at different time points uh, they can still find their way into the data set and, uh, and often it makes sense to do so but they're quite correlated that means that the training records are not for not exactly in the validation but correlate, correlated ones are and you might want to uh, do something about it otherwise your model will be focusing on memorizing some of the customers and recognizing the features that would uh, and memorizing features that would recognize rather the customers than their behavior another example chest x-rays so if you have a medical a neural network which recognizes chest rays abnormalities and uh, typically you have multiple x-rays from the same patient uh, done uh, over a period of visits uh, into the hospital and if x-rays of the same patient uh, are both in train and test data set uh, the model might actually focus on recognizing the customer from the structure of the bones rather than abnormalities it's supposed to find <clears throat> 
And last but not least, checking the validation metric too many times. Uh, that's how I personally put it. Um, the example I described before. So if you have uh, too many models you would like to choose from, then your validation uh, uh, model selection becomes an optimization uh, function of itself. And I'm going to have an example uh, in the end of how it can actually hurt. So how to fix some of these leaks? The very first and basic uh, example is stratified cross-validation. It's uh, applied to, uh, to improve some of the statistical features of the cross-validation as well as to fix some of the leaks. The first one is, um, uh, the first example here is uh, stratifying by either a target variable or some of the important predictors. Because if we just do random cross-validation and we look at the distribution of the target classes or distribution of some important predictors, it might be quite unstable, especially if we have relatively small sample or if we have uh, quite a lot of classes there. And that can uh, bring some issues. One of the issues is uh, instability of the validation scores. For instance, if one of the classes is particularly difficult to predict and one of the validation splits has the majority of that class while the others have uh, lower lower uh, contribution of that class, you will have uh, samples with quite large difference in the error, which would like you would like to probably um, correct in some way. And the, the easiest way is to do stratification. That's a technique that allows you to uh, preserve uh, as much as possible statistical distribution of the chosen variable. Usually uh, one or two, usually it's uh, impossible to stratify by a lot of variables due to cursive dimensionality, basically. Uh, but it can pick the target distribution or the distribution of a key predictor to preserve, uh, to preserve it over the validation metrics, make, making it uh, more stable to, uh, to assess. But of course, you need to keep in mind that um, um, that might be actually uh, a risky thing because if you apply this model to a new data and in the new data distribution will be quite different, then you're going to be introducing some sort of a leak here. So you'll be trusting overly this distribution you assumed uh, to be there, uh, but it's, it's going to change over time. Um, the second method is stratifying by some features that cause correlation between the records, like in the previous examples, by customer ID or patient ID. That would uh, allow, uh, that will force the cross validation to put all the records from the same patient or the same customer into one uh, validation split. So that would eliminate um, a very tricky leak, which might not be easy to. Uh, to investigate, uh, but it's it's an easy it's an easy way to to compensate for that. Uh, the third technique is called rolling window cross validation, um, and it's a very popular one. It is a way to make your test and uh, validation as well as close as possible to the production application in case you have a time uh, in some form or shape. Uh, affecting the results. Um, this is uh, typically a must for time series forecasting, but the same approach can be applied also to uh, classification, typical classification regression um, tasks as well. Credit scoring being one, where we predict some binary classification, some binary outcome, but we know the time when the customer uh, came to the branch of the bank. And we know that the time will have an impact on the model because the economy changes over the time and uh, whatever we uh, uh, experienced in the past might not be exactly uh, like this in the future. So in order to simulate the same behavior as we will, um, as, uh, as the model will uh, experience when moved to production, uh, the easiest way is to do this rolling window cross validation. So we uh, every time we take the uh, part of the data from the most latest period and we 
take the data from the period before that as training data. So we validate uh, from the future data and use the training data from the past, move back and repeat that a few times uh, to have uh, multiple validation samples to average across. Okay, uh, now moving, um, and now I'm gonna move to a couple of practical examples. Um, most of them will come from uh, CACO competitions. And I'm gonna start with, um, uh, with one of my favorite competitions, NFL Big Data Bowl competition. In this one, we were expected to build a model that predicts an outcome of a specific NFL uh, play uh, during the game. And uh, this competition was a great example of how uh, a good cross-validation setup can pay off. This picture depicts um, the correlation between cross-validation, uh, my team setup, and the tests uh, we were uh, able to uh, check during the competition. Um, the, so the cross-validation, as you can see by correlation, was very, very robust. Uh, it had some tricks we applied, including stratification, because we had plays from the same games in the sample. So we did cross-validation stratified by the game. The test set uh, provided by the NFL was um, built using rolling window. So the test set was coming from a different season of the games, while we had a uh, training data set from the previous seasons. Um, and here you, you see, um, um, I guess, approximately 40 models we uh, evaluated on tests. During the competition, we had this ability to submit some of the models to check the test performance. Uh, but the, the very important point here is that uh, we work quite heavily, and I think we built around 400 models, so 10 times the number of points you have here. And this picture just confirmed us that we can fully trust our cross-validation, meaning that for all 400 models, we were very much confident with how well they will perform on the test data, which is coming from, uh, from a completely different set of, uh, set of the games. And as you can see, the, the points are very nicely um, on the line, which is very close to uh, to the line matching the scores exactly. Actually, the test scores were a little bit better, but most importantly, they they were very well co correlated. So the lesson here is that a very well built cross validation uh, can give you a lot of confidence in what you're doing, and even without looking at test data, which you're supposed to do only once in the end, you can be very confident with how well your model will perform in the future, which is usually the key or usually the key reason to do model validation in the first place. Uh, next example uh, is from another Kaggle competition. Uh, um, it was hosted by Los Lamas National Laboratory, uh, where they uh, collected the data of artificial earthquakes. Um, in a nutshell, um, the data was collected from a laboratory device where, uh, where they put a stress on uh, particles and they uh, measured the acoustic signal. So uh, they have a bunch of microphones on the device. And with uh, increasing stress, they record the sound of some of the particles breaking, this way simulating um, the upcoming earthquake. And um, um, by the time when the stress is too much, the whole um, uh, the whole layer of uh, particles breaks, causing the laboratory earthquake. So for this competition, we were giving a sequence of this audio recordings over time, and we were uh, expected to predict what is the the expected time until the earthquake happens, or in laboratory terms, until the slayer breaks. Uh, as you can see on the right hand side, uh, the, the lower graph here is the, the acoustic signal and the top graph here is the um, basically the time until the uh, the inverted time until the, the earthquake. That's how the training data looked like. And um, surprisingly, this competition turned out to be quite uh, quite not what we expected. 
and building a very large model or generating a lot of smart features out of the acoustic signal didn't really work. What worked was uh, tricky or smart validation scheme. So I would say that at least half, half of the success was setting up the validation uh, in a smart way. Um, the thing was that we didn't have that much data, so we had just a handful of uh, laboratory earthquakes. I think we see all of them over here, Lo uh, less fewer than 20 earthquakes, and we had just a handful of earthquakes in the test data. But we had the acoustic data of the test set available for us to make predictions. So the trick we applied was um, to generate only a handful of important features from the acoustic signals. So instead of generating hundreds, we generated only four. And we used the uh, kolmogorov smirnov as, uh, as a metric to assess how far uh, the training subsamples are from the test subsamples. And what we did, we actually created the validation data, which looks as close as test data as possible by means of throwing out anything which doesn't look so. So the validation scheme that worked really well was subsampling the original training data and validation data to make it look as close as possible to the test data. So the model was uh, built and validated on the data which, uh, which was closer to the data it was assessed on. It is a very Kaggle looking trick, but um, it can be used to some extent uh, out there for business applications. Uh, sometimes, because sometimes you, you have the ability to look at your future test data, or at least some uh, samples of that data, if uh, you don't, uh, for the, especially for the cases when it takes quite a lot of time for you to learn the true target. Uh, again, a simple example of uh, credit scoring, where it usually takes 12 months to get the the true target variable for, for a single customer, but you know customer features today. So if there were some distributional changes of your customer base, you can already adjust your validation or test data set or maybe even training data set to compensate for that and to focus more on, the, on your current customers when you're building a model. Um, third example um, is actually also coming from the, the elements of statistical learning. This is what was called in the book the wrong way to do cross-validation. Um, but it's something um, um, to keep in mind, uh, and I'll have a more practical example around the, the area. Uh, in this example, um, we consider a classification problem with a large number of predictors and uh, a, a following strategy. We screen the predictors, we find a subset of the good predictors that show good correlation with the target. And after we do that, uh, we throw the remaining ones and we build uh, cross validation and tune the parameters and build the model. Um, there is a, a very crucial flaw in this strategy. And uh, in the book, they describe uh, an example of simulation of exactly this strategy where the target variable and the predictors are, are generated artificially. So basically, we're trying to predict a variable using noise as predictors. And they show that if you apply such a strategy, uh, instead of getting 50% error, as you would expect with having noise as predictors, you, you can report, uh, I think they get 3% error for such a model with uh, quite a large number of predictors which is, of course, um, a very um, unrealistic estimation. Um, and the right way, so the right, the right way to do cross-validation should give you the right results, meaning the, the error of around 50%. 50, 50 and the right way would be to screen the predictors and to find a subset of good predictors as a part of your cross-validation steps. So if you do it before you do cross-validation or before, you, uh, you define your holdout sample, then um, you will get the wrong results very likely, especially if you have large number of predictors. And one more example um, from Kaggle as well. Um, 
It is a competition that, that took place around three years ago by, uh, by Santander, um, where uh, the bank wanted the com uh, competitors to predict uh, customer transactions. Um, unfortunately, it was quite heavily anonymized. So uh, we, didn't, we still didn't know what was um, behind the, the target and the predictors. But what we were given is a binary classification task with 200 anonymized features that were very much uncorrelated. And obviously, it was done artificially. Uh, quite, uh, quite early in the competition, it became clear that a successful approach is not trying to build a single model that uses all 200 features, but rather build 200 individual models using single feature each. Why? Um, because, well, the intuition told me that um, most of the techniques like GBMs, uh, neural networks, uh, they focus a lot on finding interactions between the features, especially tree-like ones. And as soon as uh, zero correlation is given, the model focuses a lot on finding some correlation which doesn't exist there. So building individual uh, models one per feature 200 times and using product of the predicted probabilities actually gives uh, quite better results. But that, that was not it. Um, we played a lot with, uh, with different validation techniques for this particular use case. And um, the two options of how to run it uh, gave quite an interesting result here. So option one, uh, the one we applied uh, in the end, is we optimize a set of the parameters which we apply to all 200 models. So the same set of values apply 200 times to build 200 models. Um, and we optimize this one vector of parameters for all models at once. That gave, the, that gave us 92.5 ROC on, on cross-validation and 92.2 on tests. So apparently there, there was a sign of, um, um, of, an over, of a small overfit of 0.3% but it was well correlated with tests, so we proceeded further. However, um, we ran another experiment where we did something um, more feature specific or more individual model specific, uh, and something that sounded um, as, as a simple and smart thing to do. Uh, instead, of, um, instead of freezing the set of the vector of hyperparameters, we actually added simply an early stopping for each of the 200 models. So the only difference from the option one was not having a fixed number of trees and GBMs, but to have it uh, single model specific and based on the validation. So for each of the 200 models, we ran training validation and we optimized number of trees uh, uh, based on the validation. And uh, the result was the opposite of what might have one might have hoped for. The cross validation was quite much higher, ninety two point seven percent. And in terms of the competition metric, it was quite a large boost. But uh, the test score dropped ninety two point one, meaning that the difference between cross validation and stat uh, and test grew by the factor of two. So. By doing that, by doing uh, by adding all, uh, only early stopping as um, as an additional um, sort of degree of freedom to this approach, we actually increased uh, overfitting. We overestimated the model and uh, made the model perform worse on hidden data. Uh, okay, in the last few minutes, I would like to talk a little bit more about the ensembling and the importance of the validation for the ensembling. Uh, just a couple of uh, a couple of things to keep in mind and things we use a lot uh, when we work with the with the data, especially uh, for uh, when working with complex models. First uh, thing I want to mention is full fit versus bag of cross validation fits. Uh, the thing is that by default, usually uh, after we optimize the hyperparameters and we find the best vector, we just refilled the model on the full training data set. Uh, it works nice. It, it has a single model, which is fast, 
uh, if it's an interpretable model, then uh, it allows you to interpret the, the outputs. But sometimes uh, an alternative is actually uh, take a look at the three or K models, generally speaking, that you build during the cross validation. And instead of refitting one more on the full training data set, you just uh, define your final model as a bag of the K models you built. So your final prediction will be just an average of the predictions of individual of the cross validation fitted models. That will allow you not to run a full fit. And, and that actually um, would give you, uh, might be even a more robust results than a single model. Uh, usually it performs equally, but sometimes I, I believe it performs a little bit better than training a single model. And moreover, um, it might give you a little bit more trust in the final model because for each of the model uh, of the models in this bag of models, you know your exact validation score and uh, therefore you can trust there was no uh, issues during the training um, um, for, for some maybe technical reasons, maybe uh, um, uh, some routine might break during the training of the full fit. So here you, kn you know uh, that everything worked fine and the validation was, uh, was okay for these models. Uh, second thing is stacking. It's a technique which is very popular to squeeze uh, the most accuracy for tabular models. Uh, but in order for it to work, you need to do a careful cross-validation. Um, if you do it carefully, then you can generate a new data set um, where instead of feature, instead of original features, you use the predictions. Uh, out of full predictions of your models that you built, say multiple GBMs, multiple neural networks, and then you, you get new data set of the same size with the same target, but new features. And you can build another model on top of that. So that'll build you a uh, sort of a pipeline where the input of the second layer of models will be the outputs of the first layers of models. Um, and uh, one more thing, just to keep in mind that nested cross-validation is something you might consider doing if you, uh, if you find yourself struggling with a leak or you want to build a very uh, robust pipeline and build a large stack of the models. In a nutshell, it's nothing but running uh, cross-validation within cross-validation. So if you do cross-validation, cake fold cross-validation, that would may mean you will build all in all k squared number of models but that can compensate you from uh, introducing a model selection bias. Okay, this is, this is it. Thanks a lot.